this video we are going to learn about the first land animals the amphibians the term amphibian has its origin in the greek language amphi means dual or uh, two uh, bians or bios means life so these are organisms that have adapted for uh, two lives meaning on water and on land now what could have led to these organisms being this way to know that we have to go back to the time when these organisms evolved that was the devonian period which is roughly 400 to 350 million years ago now mind you devonian period is called as the golden age of fishes meaning we only had fishes and other aquatic animals during this period devonian period was also undergoing a lot of other changes so there were climatic changes temperatures were increasing and there were extensive tectonic plate movements both these led to fluctuating water levels all over the globe now the aquatic organisms realized they had to have some kind of adaptation to survive these changes and that is what they did the evolution of lung like sacs in the fishes set the stage for the vertebrate invasion of the land but this in itself was not enough because uh, the animals need to move on the land right so next were changes in the way they moved around so fishes started replacing their very delicate fins with a thick structures called as lobes so these are lobe finned fishes uh, lobe finned fishes and one such fish is the lung fish that you see here lung fish it's called as latimeria Uh, now lung fishes are predators in shallow waters and when the water levels go down um, they can burrow themselves in the mud and they can remain alive but inactive because they are breathing the atmospheric air it is believed that these lung fishes somehow adapted themselves to uh, live uh, consuming the vegetation on the land and that finally led to what we call as tetrapods or the four legged creatures So how do we know this happened? Uh, that's because scientists found a fossil belonging to an animal named as Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik is a uh, intermediate between the fins and the tetrapods. So somewhere where they still had fins but started developing the limbs as well. So you can see that these leg fins are supporting the animal to um push themselves out of the water and this almost looks like a crocodile doesn't it amphibians were an earlier branch of these tetrapods uh, which lived in moist environment while most of the other tetrapods adapted themselves to drier conditions that is why amphibians have a dual life where they live between the land and water most of the amphibians have two pairs of limbs so they have a fore limb and they have hind limbs as well and if you see the um, skeletal structures of these limbs you would see similarities between amphibians reptiles birds and the mammals um the body is divisible into head and trunk uh, they do not have any neck uh, they have a very short vertebral column and the hip or the pelvic region of the amphibians are designed for leaping hopping and uh, propelling their body through water because they use their hind limbs to jump through them tails may be present in some amphibians so what you see here are uh, salamanders and you also have amphibians which look like worms so uh, we can say there are three types of amphibians you would see so these worm like creatures called as cecilians and tailed amphibians which are salamanders and the tailless amphibian which is your frog most modern amphibians are confined to a moist environment because they lose water quickly when their skin is exposed to dry air so the way they adapted is by making their skin really moist with the help of mucus so the skin is extremely thin and they have mucus glands under the skin and the mucus glands keeps on producing mucus all the time uh, they also got rid of the scales which their ancestors fishes had although they live on land they actually prefer water as their main habitat um their eyes also have eyelids like ours 
but in addition to the regular eyelids top and bottom they also have an eyelid called as the nictitating membrane nictitating membrane these are transparent and they actually help the um, amphibians when they are in water so you can see here the eyelids are netted right so this is a camouflage type of an eyelid you will see in some frogs they do not have any external ears but you see this uh, circular patch this is the tympanum tympanum which is nothing but the eardrum so the eardrum directly acts as the external ear for amphibians let's talk about the anatomy of an amphibian starting with the heart um their heart is three chambered so they have uh, two auricles that are completely separated you have the right atrium and the left atrium then they have a single ventricle which is not separated there are two important blood vessels present one is the sinus venosus which brings deoxygenated blood to the heart and then we have conus arteriosus which sends out blood from the heart to different parts of the body So the way this works is that your sinus arteriosus it uh, brings blood from different parts of the body like this so these are from the upper parts of the body and this is from the lower regions of the body and they are connected to the right atrium so deoxygenated blood is found in the right atrium so we have the deoxygenated blood you also have blood vessels coming in from the lungs which are actually bringing oxygenated blood now deoxygenated blood and the oxygenated blood both enter into the ventricles but they don't extensively mix because of these ridges that you see here now when the ventricle pumps uh, the blood enters into the conus arteriosus and there is a, a branch which goes on to the right and the left now which the one to the left uh, supplies the blood to the aorta and from there it goes to different parts of the body the heart also receives blood from the skin because the circulatory system of an amphibian carries uh, mixed blood um the efficiency of oxygen consumption and transport in the body is highly reduced so this is complemented by a very good respiratory system amphibians respire by different structures the external gills are um, projections from the body and they are highly folded so this increases the surface area that is available for oxygen exchange or gas exchange this type of respiration is called as the branchial respiration uh, this is usually seen in aquatic amphibians next we have uh, the lungs these are sac like structures uh, where the oxygen exchange happens um, this is called as pulmonary respiration Uh, finally amphibians are also able to uh, exchange gas through their skin so they are capable of cutaneous respiration all these respiratory organs are highly vascularized meaning they have a lot of tiny capillaries in close contact with the uh, medium that they are exposed to so it could be air or water and that is why they are able to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide um salamanders uh, have external gills as well as lungs as their respiratory structures um tadpoles rely on gills initially and then when they grow up to be an adult they uh, grow lungs as well as are able to breathe through their skin the worm like amphibian the cecilian they are also able to breathe through the lungs and the skin the other anatomical structures in a frog are very similar to humans So this is the digestive system where there is a mouth and esophagus a stomach and we also have a uh, pancreas and the liver um we can see the rectum and this is how the solid waste goes out um the urinary system and the uh, reproductive system so this is the urinary and this is the reproductive both these are in very close contact with each other you can see it over here you will notice that all three of these systems exit through a common opening and this is called as a cloaca this cloaca is seen in all organisms uh, like fishes uh, reptiles uh, birds and it's only when uh, vertebrates started coming into the picture there was a clear separation between the digestive urinary and the reproductive systems 
In amphibians, the sexes are separate, meaning you have two different animals representing a female and a male. We can see that the male frog is usually smaller. So this is actually the male and the bigger one here is the female. Um, amphibians also have a very complex, weird social behavior. Now, the male frogs are able to uh, utter this loud cry and these cries are very species specific. The primary function of this is to attract the female during the breeding season. So, it sounds something like this. These sounds are also used to defend their territory, breeding territory, and they also fight with other males uh, for the females. The adults mostly live on land. We have already seen that, right? But they return to fresh water for reproduction. The adult frog lives on the land. So we have a female and a male. And you already saw how the male had mounted onto a female, right? So after the mating process, they release uh, millions of um, uh, sperms and ovums. So they fertilize to form this zygote. So zygote then develops and it forms a tadpole. And we can see that these tadpoles look almost like uh, fishes. They use gills for their breathing and they have a fin and a tail and they move around in the water. And slowly they start developing the body of an adult frog. And finally when they uh, adapt themselves to the land, they lose the tail. You can see that the development happens in a stage-wise manner. And this kind of development in animals is called as metamorphosis. Amphibians are oviparous creatures. Oviparous. It means they lay their eggs. The male and the female release sperms and ovums respectively into the water simultaneously, which then um, combine to form these zygotes. You can see the fertilized eggs are surrounded by this jelly-like substance. This is for the protection of the zygote because more often than not, you find these zygotes in shallow water. So they are exposed to the air and it could dry out the zygotes. The jelly mass ensures that that doesn't happen. Um, and because the fertilization has happened outside the body of the female, it is an external fertilization. External fertilization. 